my name is Tatum Dooley and I'm a writer and founder of Canadian Art Forecast. And this is part of our video series where Canadian Art Forecast has teamed up with Art Plus Public Unlimited to bring you a behind the scenes look at Canadian artist practices. So today I'm joined by Hengema Emery to chat about her figurative art practice, her works in tactile and the narrative themes throughout her art. Um, Hengema and I talked for her towards gallery show and so I'm really looking forward to revisiting some of those conversations and touching on what's new. Um, Hengema Emery is an Afghan Canadian artist. She holds an MFA from Yale University and a BFA from NASCAD University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Select recent solo exhibitions include Wandering Admits the Coloreds at Albert's Benda in New York, Spectators of a New Dawn at Towards Gallery, Toronto, Bazaar, a re recollection of home at T T293 Gallery in Rome, and Ocean's Edge at Laurie Swim Gallery in Lundberg, Nova Scotia. Great. So I guess I wanted to start off with saying, like, of course, Afghanistan has been in the news lately. People are reading the news, are also seeing on social media that the Taliban has gained power in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And I know last time we talked, that was kind of a, a looming threat and now it's unfortunately come true. So I'm wondering if you wanna comment on, at all on that or if you're thinking about your art practice um, differently in this last coming, uh, the last few weeks. Of course, I would love to share my, my sort of feelings and some sort of, um, you know, process that I've been through as well. Um, it has been definitely a heartbreaking days and heartbreaking moments for especially for Afghan people who are even living abroad and having something or hearing something or even witnessing something from far away that you're seeing that your country is being attacked by those warlords again. And once again, the Taliban especially, it brings a lot of bad memories it brings a lot of horrific memories um even though myself uh flee at the brinsk of the taliban regime took over in 1996 i still have memories vividly in my head as a young child um you know when they even announced that girls were not allowed to go to educations and or work or even they're only allowed to go into public unless they're accompanied by a male member or family male member so these were the things that I witnessed as a child, but I could understand how people are going through um, and they are really worried about their families right now in Kabul, especially, and many other provinces. So it's been a very devastating time, to be honest. It's been hard to process it from a far away or from a far distance too, because sometimes even as an artist, I feel like I'm so helpless uh, that I can do much more about it, except to just, um, you know, continue to make work about these horrific moments that are happening and continue to fight for women's rights through my art and, and, and through my voice. Um, but other than that, all I could do is just uh, be attached with my families or four relatives in Afghanistan. Um, yeah, it's... Um, it's an ongoing process, to be honest. It's only had been three days only after when they, you know, you know, like took control of the whole country. Um, it's horrible. It's horrible what's going on there right now. I, I feel as if some of the context of your work almost becomes more powerful in this time because it, it is often of women in public in Afghanistan. And now with that being threatened so greatly mm -hmm. like the, it, it becomes a snapshot of of another time so I wonder if you want to chat a little bit about how you choose the compositions and how your memory takes uh, a large role in what you decide mm -hmm. to create art with of course I think it's it's really hard to believe because the bodies of work that I created for Towards Gallery it wasn't that much a long time ago it was pretty much a few months ago this year and the whole series that I worked through at the year of the pandemic was to being in touch with my relatives from back home and sort of capturing um, the current tension or the current uh, sort of worrisome that young people were having 
in the in the idea of Taliban are coming back or going to come back and what's going to happen to their you know progress of like 20 years inside Afghanistan right so I did a series about uh, bringing these young voices and contemporary stories in my work through a stretching fabrics and it's just really it's really hard to just imagine what I was working on a few months ago and how the work has shifted the story and the narratives. And I keep wondering that how my cousins are doing right now, what sort of stories are taking or they are taking for themselves right now. It's like this reality actually unfold itself, you know? And it's just really difficult to, to see that. But, but for me, I mean, I, I have always been interested in working through memories, but also through, um, individual stories or personal stories that I have or personal engagements that I have with my people back home. So, and I will continue bring them in these uh, spaces of textile pieces that I'm working on. So I am, I'm also in the midst of, uh, you know, conversation within myself and within my practice and how sort of, or, or like what sort of narrative my practice will take shape, you know? So it's it's an interesting moment, but also it's 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 a very it's a very edgy moment as well for me right now. Looking at your practice, it becomes like a historical, emotional, autobiographical archive of a moment in time in your life and your family's life. Right, and I I keep thinking about this exhibition that I've done at Tito Line Tree Gallery about uh, the bazaar, a recollection of home. Mm -hmm. And that whole series or that whole exhibition was such about the celebratory of women's progress in the country that I have witnessed of going back recently in Afghanistan. And I just keep thinking uh, when I saw the images recently through social media that, you know, people were covering the public images or, you know, women's of representation through salons, you know, by painting them. And it just felt so sad. It felt so bizarre for me to see that reality unfold that like once again uh you know things are changing public the you know you know like the conversation around women uh, mobility in public might change or is changing right now and that's really hard uh, heartbreaking i would say um yeah and it's it's difficult it's difficult i would say yeah yeah yeah, I saw that image as well. And I, I thought about the work that you have done in the art, um, the images you showed me of the photographs you took in Kabul. Mm -hmm. What what draws you to the, your um, capturing of public spaces, including bazaars and places, you know, I think food often comes in and shopping mm -hmm. and what draws you to capturing those spaces? Yeah, of course. Um, those are the spaces that I grew up uh, or the environment that I felt uh, most happy with, to be honest, like bazaars was uh, one of the closest spaces um, that were, uh, I used to commute before going to school in Kabul city. And for me going back, even back to Afghanistan and seeing the environment shift or the, uh, or, you know, the representation around women was very different, especially the uh, seeing the business side of it, even though like back in the 1996, um, most stores were run by men. But in 2010 and, and 2012, when I went back, um, I saw a lot of business women owning businesses such as, uh, you know, tailor shops, restaurants, like beauty salons. There are so many beauty salons run by women, by Afghan women. So seeing those like a fragile changes in such public or male dominated public, uh, you know, community, it's, uh, it, it's very enlightening for me to see even or, or to even witness that. So that's why I really am interested in the public and the representation of it, because there was, um, there was a slight changes that happened. Uh, if we compare that during the Taliban regime or, 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 or like during the civil war um, in comparison to nowadays, you know. And you also try to capture the scale of the bazaars within mm -hmm. your work. They're a large scale, especially within that show at uh, T293 Gallery in Rome. These were massive pieces. Um, 
how important is that for you to translate the actual scale and feeling of being within these spaces? Absolutely. I think um, in my work, I'm very much interested in the ideas of world building. Um, a world building in a sense that uh, to create a some sort of, <clears throat> excuse me, to create a some sort of environment that I could feel close to those fragile childhood memories that I have left behind from Afghanistan, but also to create a cultural location to invite um, a new narrative that people could uh, learn from or like see or even experience, right? So for me also uh, the larger scale artworks also represents a way that uh, it represents you know, some sort of power too. A scale represents power sometimes, uh, especially if you look in the Renaissance paintings, uh, large paintings uh, you know, very much identified with, with power and they were usually considered very highly important and in institutions, right? So for me also as an Afghan artist, I want my work to also read in those stages of institutions. And uh, I mean, that's only, one criteria, but the other criteria was to, um, I love transforming experiences as a viewer. So as a viewer, when you enter, you're not only seeing a piece in the wall, but you're also being engaged with the pieces because fabric is such interesting material because um, it's very tactile, uh, you know, tactile, as you mentioned, it's, it, it's something that you can be wrapped with or, you know, like wrapped around it. It's something that you can stretch it rip it apart and um, and you can do so much about it right so that how I mean like that's how um, you know because it has so much functionality I could do so much with the material so I have that freedom and that's why the ideas of wall building stretches so well with using fabric so yeah and especially like uh, bazaar is you know, when you enter bazaar, the idea of a bazaar is so mixed pot of everything, right? It's such a diverse kind of idea. So you're not only uh, interacting with one object, but you're being interacted with so many different things at the same time, right? You're becoming part of that community and, and part of that, uh, you know, crowd. So a noise. So I really wanted to create that sort of environment of, um, of noise and loudness through choosing colors, through choosing you know, representations of women in the banners, and also um, using um, rope or power rope that you know, connects from one corner to the other corner. So that way you're also being like enveloped and like kind of weaved inside the space, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say that when I was at the Showa Towards Gallery, I noticed that where it's like these figures are larger than life, they do feel very powerful because they're looming over you. And then mm -hmm. as the viewer, you also have the experience to get quite close to the fabric and then it, it completely transfers the experience into seeing, you know, the minute details of your stitching mm -hmm. and the painting onto the canvas. So I was curious about your journey from painting into working with fabric and how you feel that painting maybe still influences the work that you're doing um, and the way that, you know, I know you touched a little bit on the, the power of fabric, but mm -hmm. also what your actual process of uh, creating these are like. Right. Um, I still love painting. I think painting was my first medium that I was introduced to art. Um, I think painting has so many different dimensions and so many different uh, explorations that it's uncountable, I would say. And that's what makes it so exciting all the time, always. Um, I still think like painterly when I work with fabric, especially, um, especially with the, with, you know, like choosing my palette or choosing colors and, and, and you know, compositions, um, but also, um, but also the language of painting is also really amazing for me. And I, whenever I start working through fabrics, I usually start work with painting first. Either I do my sketches in gouache painting or color pencil. And from there, even when I go to stores, I, I, I pretty much bring my sketchbooks in order to choose colors and in order to match color from my sketchbooks into the fabric. So, you could, so as you could see, my relation with, with painting always starts with painting and how I think about color too. 
um, maybe you could talk a little bit about like, you know, do you um, have, you know, any like teachings in actual stitching or were you taught that as a child or any in school? And then also I'd love to hear a little bit about the actual stores that you go to in New York to pick out the fabric. Of course. In. Of course. I feel like my childhood experiences uh, or like my relation with fabric is um, has been written a long, long time ago, I would say. Um, my uncle in Kabul city, uh, where I used to grow up in Makriyana Kohna, he was a tailor and he still is a tailor. And he had a small uh, shop in the bazaar that was very close to our apartments. And whenever I used to go before school, I would always, you know, drop by at his workshop and at the shop and see what he was working on. So my introduction to fabric was from a really earlier on, early age. But from not from that experience, but also just walking around bazaars and being so confronted with so many amazing shiny fabrics from Central Asia and South Asian you know, countries. It's really enriching experience to grow up with. Um, and not only that, even, even as a refugee, um, being introduced to so many different cultural fabrics, like uh, you know, from Tajikistan, from Pakistan, from India, uh, these are the countries that uh, have really inspired me to, to look about colors, shapes, patterns, and they're so enriching and they're so bold and beautiful as well. So I grew up wearing them. I grew up seeing them, touching them, feeling them. So I guess my love for fabric and my love for textile has always been there. And that's how when I start, uh, you know, painting, I was really interested to paint the cultural materials through my memory, like the cultural fabrics through my memory. And slowly, slowly the language of uh, you know, textiles sort of shifted because I became much more closer to the material to start using the material in a state of uh, making a replication of it by using paint or by using oil paint. So there is this sort of like battle conversation that I've always had with the materiality of them. And uh, when I start using uh, textiles in my school at Yale, I, I become very much fascinated by starting first collage. I start using collages of fabric and painting on canvas at the same time. And then slowly, slowly there, I just adapted myself to use only fabric and, um, and let the fabric do its own thing, right? So I give all the power to the you know, textiles. And that's how I become much more engaged and much more um, um, invested in the material. And um, I mean, that was, that was my first inspiration. But also I could also mention because uh, when I remember before coming to Yale, a few years back after graduating NASCAD, I was also working as a gallery assistant uh, at Laurie Swan Gallery in Nova Scotia. And she was a very well-known quilt person. And I feel like my, also my introduction to to quilting or fabric was also became from there too. Um, and I was really introduced to her work and how she was working. But quilting is a very different method, I would say. The only thing that I learned from that was the fabric applique. And that's how I use my work this uh, starts with fabric applique a lot. So that was also my another uh, kind of introduction to textile artists and, and textile art. So it was amazing. It was really amazing. I think once I come to Yale, it all just weave together pretty much. <laughs> and, now that you uh, mention it, it almost feels like um, in, in incorporating textile and craft or these elements of quilting, it is very much reclaiming something that was discredited because it was women's work for so long. So it, it feels as if they're, the medium and the message are um, coinciding very nicely in your work. Definitely. I also, since I learning more or investing much of my study practice by using these different textiles, I, I'm, I'm really finding that how fabric also carries memory, how fabric is also a very fragile kind of material too, and how also it, it captures a smell and touch and texture. So I feel like it really connects what I was really uh, 
you know, working towards because since I'm so much invested working through my childhood memories and all that and just having fabric and using fabric, it really made my work closer, what I was looking for, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that maybe we could talk about a couple um, images from your show at Towards. And if you okay. wanted to expand, I know the ones that kind of stand out to me are the ones with two people in them. There is the one with two people sitting and then standing next to a tank mm -hmm. and then the mm -hmm. night meeting of the nocturne of two people on a roof. And I think that, you know, there's an ability to project so much onto those images and to try to imagine what those people are speaking about and what the context of their meeting is. Um, mm -hmm. So I wonder if you mm -hmm. uh, wanted to share any of the origins of those paintings. Two pieces definitely talks about the, the language of love and the language um, of passion and sort of affection when you have towards another, uh, you know, different sex and um, how that language is also very risky to explore in society like Afghanistan. Um, it's something is also very dangerous and something that young people do it secretly if, if, if their lovers are outside of their family wishes. So for me, um, I even had myself a personal experience in those situations when I went to visit Afghanistan for the first time. Um, I was not introduced to so many uh, social behavioral codes. <laughs> Um, I was very much a little bit freely in my actions or in my body language, but um, I end up knowing that uh, love was a, such a secret word. It, it was a, such a, uh, not dangerous, not that, but like it's, it's such a very fragile thing to even talk about in public or talk about uh, with, with other male members. You can, as a woman, you can only express about your love and affection with other women you know but for me I would hear a lot of stories of you know young couple would meet um, outside of their family wishes uh, you know somewhere nowhere so no one could know where they are in a way for them to some sort of um, have a space to uh, feel and to meet and to grieve right so there were a lot of love stories I would hear and I really wanted to dedicate uh, two pieces um, for that uh, for that sort of like the, the danger of living uh, with your own choice and a very male yeah uh, once you live in a male dominated societies uh, these things could be so um, difficult to reach right so for me I really wanted to dedicate uh, the the expression towards love and the love language um, you know from those young people who are who are struggling to have or reach uh, the night's visit is from my personal experience um, uh, that um, I had maybe a very less affair with some with, with some friend and we were invited and I guessed uh, in, a, in a sort of like guest situation and then um, the guy or the person was like uh, meet me uh, at the roof at the rooftop so this idea of like meet me at the rooftop and girls should always uh, ignore that, right? But I said, yes, because I really wanted to meet him, right? Because I was like, oh, maybe this is my chance to meet this person in person. And uh, I went upstairs at night, it was really beautiful night. And night in Kabul is really magical, I would say, um, because uh, I think the landscape is uh, so mountainous all around you. And you would see these houses with lights light up and it's just like uh, you see like stars uh, in the in the ground and also stars at night so it's a really beautiful experience to be and I was really happy to share that uh, moment and meet this person at the roof but then uh, when I came down and when I told my other girlfriends and cousins and they were like oh my god what did you just do <laughs> they were like uh, you know what would neighbors say what would other people would say so you could see like the you know the difference even meeting a people outside alone um, at the rooftop uh, you are still uh, becoming the spectators right so the whole exhibition title came from that piece as well spectators of a new dawn but not only from the love perspective, but also 
um, how the young people are seeing this new world ahead of them, you know. They are being the spectators and the whole landscape and that homeland being the spectators back, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are other in, uh, works also self-portraits? I'm thinking of the like, portrait of a lady in a cafe um, and also just like how prominent the nails are in that work. And also I'm noticing your lovely nails today. So I wonder <laughs> if there is a connection. Of course, I feel like um, when I even work with when I work with females or women subject, especially, and when they are, you know, you know, gazing directly or gazing away from, I always also think about myself too in that position too, and how I would feel in that position to put myself there. But they are not so; they are not self-portrait, but it definitely reflects um, how would I feel if I, you know, like when I was there. Mm -hmm. So it's both my story and also other women's story that share the same experience pretty much. And my inspiration of nails and red polish, red nail polish is also something that comes from my um, early on to sort of witness when, I mean, uh, through my mom, like my mom, my aunts uh, loved makeup, loved doing their nails. And it's something, it's such a fragile, and such such a basic, uh, you know, treatment for women, like to do. But during the Taliban and during those civil war, they start not wearing anything, not wearing shiny stuff, not wearing uh, nail polish. So something that they couldn't show, right? Because nail polish attracts the male gaze and you don't want, um, once you're in public, you don't want to, um, attract that side because it's shiny, it reflects. So for me, this uh, sort of the ideas of reflection, the ideas of uh, the creation of our body is so important. Um, it's a way for me to celebrate back uh, those things that were taken away from them, right? And I've always carried this, uh, this nail situation since uh, my young age. And I've always been interested in you know, doing my nails is such a small treatment that I have, uh, you know, for myself as a woman, and I will always continue doing it, right? Um, so yeah, those are the inspiration, definitely. So they are say my, you know, self portrait, but also say my uh, reflecting the experiences of Afghan women there. I do see a um, repetition of images that seem as if they're from adverts or even there is a couple there's one that seemed like stock images of like ha like couples in love in the one piece at towards gallery with the text and so what draws you to um using these advertising images um collaged within your paintings definitely uh those are those are kind of like a references that specific piece, um, I know which one you're talking about, it's all embroidered by machine. Mm -hmm. And uh, embro uh, I think there's a few things that I can mention. The one thing, the reason that I embroidered that piece is also a form of language. It's a form of letter. It's a form of uh, 4C letter or 4C text, as if a lover is sending a postcard to another lover. It's something that I have witnessed a lot in Afghanistan. That's the only form of, um, uh, you know, connection that couple would have, right? By by uh, posting and collaging Bollywood uh, postcards and other uh, well-known actresses and actors and kind of uh, their representation of affection and, um, and sort of, uh, you know, romance that they show. And, you know, like they would put in these postcards in order to show how they feel about their uh, loved ones, right? So for me, that piece really represented as a sort of, it's also very different from other bodies of work, but that one specifically is a form of language, is a form of uh, receiving and giving. Yeah. Um, the other question I had also, I think deals with language and that it was that I loved to see that you designed the World Refugee Day emoji on Twitter and so, was wondering what that experience was like and how did you you know going from making fine art to making an emoji was that uh, an easy uh, transition for you or is it it's kind of it's similar it's all language 
it was not an easy process. It looks a very easy image to come up, <laughs> you know, come up with, but I feel like the process was so difficult. They don't know was because since I work with such a large scale artworks and shifting my my designs or I mean shifting my art into design and thinking like a designer was a very difficult task for me. It's because now I have to think of an image or of a language that could also be very simple, very powerful, and also very universal. That not only directs one person or the other, but it has to direct globally, right? And and kind of transforming my ideas of like, okay, I work really large and my work is very detailed and how am I gonna come up with like two symbols? Mm -hmm. And slowly, slowly, we, we did a lot of sketches and, and also you have to, uh, you know, once I used to made a lot of like sketches, they would compress it into a uh, very tiny, you know, emoji and, mm -hmm. and cell phones so are small. a tiny thing that you have to, it has to be visible, right? So all those sketches were so complex. It had lots of information. So by reducing that and working on it for two months or one month, I believe, um, I came up with the power of like, well, I love hands, you know, hand shows um, a lot of things. It's about power. It's about controlness. It's about, you know, support. And, and heart is such a universal uh, symbol that a four-year-old child could understand that, anyone could understand that. So just representing that as if it's holding a heart in between, as if like a heart and within it's a heart. So it's, it was a very successful project to come up with. And um, I was deeply you know, attached by that project as well because working uh, with such organizations like UNHCR is, um, is the organization that also helped me coming to Canada uh, when I was really young. And uh, so it, the project was really perfect for my practice to work on and give something back. So I was very happy to be uh, you know, chosen for that uh, uh, yeah, project for this year's. <laughs> That's such a beautiful story and also really incredible how you packed like, so much into such a simple image while also keeping kind of your distinct style of art into an emoji. So I love that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And so just to end up, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about or any upcoming projects you'd like to mention? Sure. Um, I wish I could visit this upcoming show that I have in Toronto at Cooper Cole. And this is happening in September, last week of September of this year. Um, but I hope that my Canadian friends and fellow would, you know, take a day off and go see the show for me and for, <laughs> for the sake of the arts. I feel like I'm very excited about this body of work. And, um, and yeah, this is the upcoming fresh project that I have for my Canadian fellows and for everyone who loves art. Oh, that's so great to hear. I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Thank you so much, Hangama. Thank you for having me, Tatum. This was a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah.